Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the history course. You know, we picked a topic, you know, four defining dates in Jewish history. You know, and I, th I thought that if we hit these four dates and talked about all of the things that were surrounding these dates, you know, we'd pretty much cover uh, 2,000 years of Jewish history. Um, I want to start off by giving a quote from the great historian. Uh, he, was a, he was a professor at the Columbia University, Salo Baron who decried the uh, lachrymose conception of Jewish history. I mean, what that basically means is that many people f believe that Jewish history is just one tragedy after another, after another, after another. I mean, if you look at it, you know, we, we fought a war, we won, we kept fighting another war, we ate, we won, we fought some more, we ate some more, you know, I mean, well, you know, one thing after another. I mean, it's not so, I mean, of, of course Jews have had their uh, share of ups and downs, like, uh, and maybe a little bit more than the average nation, but there are many parts within Jewish history that are actually highlights, and hopefully during this course, the next four weeks, we'll be able to touch upon some of those positive and uplifting uh, places within Jewish, you know, Jewish history. The Jews existing today are an anomaly. I mean, the fact that we're still around today, I mean, as Jews, you know, here in the United States, in Israel, having our own country is something that, if you went back 500 years, 1,000 years ago, and you had people predict would Jews be around today, you wouldn't get good odds. You wouldn't have good odds, because it was that we, we, we've, we've gone through so much, not only in, the, in, 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 in tribulations, in trials and tribulations, but through assimilation. You know, through conversions and, and, and leaving Judaism. And the fact that we're still here is, I, no one could say this better than on some non Jew by the name of, I think you may have heard of him. His name was uh, Mark Twain. You heard of, you've heard of Mark Twain, right? Everybody's heard of Mark Twain. And Mark Twain wrote about the Jewish people. He said a little, hun a little over 100 years ago, you know, he wrote this. And he said, if the statistics are right, the Jews constitute but one quarter of one percent of the human race. A nebulous dim puffed of stardust lost in the blaze of the Milky Way. Now, I mean, this of course is Mark Twain writing. I mean, who can write like him? Probably the Jews are hardly to be heard of, but he is heard of, has always been heard of, has made a marvelous fight in this world in all ages, and has done it with his hands tied behind him. The Egyptians, Babylonians, and Persians rose, filled the planet with sound and splendor, then faded to dream stuff and passed away. The Greeks and the Romans followed and made a vast noise, and they are gone. Other peoples have sprung up and held their torch high for a time, but it burned out, and they sit in twilight now or have vanished. The Jew saw them all, survived them all, and is now what he always was. All things are mortal but the Jew. All other forces pass, but he remains. And then he asks, what is the secret of his immortality? That's how he ends. So, you know what, it, 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 it's just fascinating when you read that from someone like Mark Twain writing about the Jewish people. I think, I mean, I personally am fascinated by Jewish history. I mean, I just love it, it's so interesting, you know. So I thought, hey, you know what, so let's talk about four distinct dates. And we'll go back 2,000 years to the very, very beginning of what we call the Christian era. Because really, that's really where we define the date, the, 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 the year zero from. What was going on over there? The Jewish people had lived in the land of Israel for over 1,000 years. They had come out of Egypt, settled in Israel. It took them a while. They built a temple. The temple stood for first temple a few hundred years, 400 years, was destroyed. The Jews were exiled to Babylon. Together, they made some of them, uh, not very many, made it back you know, for the first commonwealth, and they built a second temple. And this second temple lasted a little bit longer than the first temple. It lasted 420 years. And I want to pick up the story just at about the year zero. Because in the year zero, what happens is, is that the Jewish people find themselves now under a foreign dominion. Who is that? The Romans. Now, how did the Romans get to Israel? Okay. 
The Roman Empire, I don't have to tell you, you want to read Edmund Gibbons, I mean, uh, he writes The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire. It was, was the, probably the strongest and greatest empire that ever existed. I mean, at the height of their empire, they were from Gaul all the way to, the, to, to well past to the Middle East, all the way, you know, in, in, you know near, <laughs> near, near, near Persia. They were strong, they were powerful, their emperors, many of them had this unbelievable appetite for conquering, and this, wherever they could lay their hands on, they went. Judea was, until the year 63 BC, until 63 years before the day that we're, we're talking about, was pretty much an independent state, except of course run over by the, by the Greeks and this and that, but at this point right now the Greeks had left. And the Hashwanoim, if you remember the story of Hanukkah, uh, Judah Maccabee had chased the, Egypt, uh, chased the Greeks out of Israel and freed the country, and they were an autonomous people. They were an autonomous people. Then the Romans came around. Now the Romans were invited in. Why? Because there was conflict within Judea itself. Because what generally happens is great conqueror Judah Maccabee conquers the country. He dies, his brother takes over. He dies, his son takes over. Then eventually there's two sons, and then there's four sons, and the four sons figure who's gonna take over. So you had John Hyrcanus fighting against his brother Aristobulus. You know, back and forth over who was gonna be the king. Well, one of them figures, hey, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna invite the Romans in as my ally. And if I bring in the Romans as my ally, my brother will never be able to, to, to stop them. And that's exactly what happened. In the year 63, the Romans marched into Judea. And as we always talk about, there's a very famous saying, why don't you invite a bear for lunch? You know why? Because it stays for dinner. That's exactly right. Because it's hard to get, hard to get rid of him. So that's exactly what happened with the Romans. The Romans came, settled in Israel, and even after John Hyrcanus and Aristobulus had passed away, they're not leaving. They figured, hey, this is a nice country, we like it, we want to add it to the empire, and they put in their own king. Who was king at this point right now? Herod the Great. Herod the Great was now a vassal king, as we call him. I mean, he was a Jewish king. He came from a tribe called the Idumeans. His father was a fellow by the name of Antipater, and Antipater was the ultimate, the perfect politician. I mean, he just had a way with knowing which way the political winds are blowing. Because in those days, if you're caught on the wrong side of the political spectrum, it's not like today, you know, you could have the right wing and you have the left wing and Republicans and Democrats. There, it was very dangerous if you happen to be a Democrat with a Republican emperor. I mean, or a, a Republican with a Democratic emperor. So you know what? People just lost their heads, literally, you know, you know in those days. So, but Antipater was able to somehow be able to maneuver the, you know, all of the political changes. And his son Herod was appointed king at this particular time. Herod was a very proud and crazy man. Very, very crazy. I mean, you know, he was ruthless and slaughtered thousands of people. But at the same time, he had this grandiose plan of building up Judea, of, you know, of making it glamorous. Because the temple itself, the first temple was great and beautiful. King Solomon had built it. It was full of riches and ah, oh, it was glorious. The second temple was built by a bunch of refugees. You know, coming back from Babylon, they didn't have much money. They, they were poor people. They barely put together a temple made out of wood where, where his was gold and silver and diamonds. Theirs were of wood and, you know, the shoestrings and, you know, whatever you can, whatever you can get put, you know, put together. Came along Herod and said, come on, this is a temple for the Jews. So he, re no, didn't rebuild the temple, but he refurnished it. As well as if you go to Israel and you go up the coast and you find many of the great you know, the great uh, amphitheaters and, and, and these places, you know, thanks, this was thanks, all thanks to Herod. And Herod being the vassal king of the ruling party, which of course is the Romans, okay? The Jewish people themselves lived, you know, under Roman dominion and uh, they functioned. I mean, you know, the Romans themselves had a very uh, liberal policy towards their conquered people. I mean, uh, so basically, by, besides killing more or less all of the leadership, besides killing the leadership, they let everybody, you know, just just uh, cool, chill, hey, you know, hang out. You know, they didn't, they didn't, they weren't there to change the nature of the and the character of the civilization that they were conquering. 
And there was a number of reasons for that. Number one is, you know what, they weren't religious. When I say they weren't religious, I mean they weren't Catholic in the sense. I mean, they didn't believe that everybody has to believe what they believe. What did the Romans believe? They were pagans. So the Romans, you know, you had this God and then next with that God and that God. So, you know, they weren't, they weren't zealous, you know, in changing religion. You know, and as long as you paid your taxes and behaved and were good boys and girls and, you know, and did whatever, you know, so they, they got along. They, they got along fine with people. So here was the Jewish people living under the, um, the dominion of the Romans and uh, living kind of with this Meshuggah Herod who you never know one day, you know, he killed his own wife and, and sons. I mean, that's how crazy he was. But everybody knew that, you know, Herod is going to die sooner or later. And thank God he died. You know, so they had another king and Agrippas and Agrippas II and so on and so forth. And you paid your taxes. Of course, in Rome, there was always Roman emperors that were uh, very, very eccentric. I mean, you know, they tried, tried to interfere with the temple service, but a statue, you know, Caligula was one of them, which was, he you know, was a bit strange. And Nero was a little bit strange, you know. But for the most part, the Jews who were not wealthy people, I mean, this was not a very, very you know, a rich country, you know, but kind of, you know, made, you know, they made their, uh, their, their peace, you know, with them, which was, of course, not everybody, not everybody, because in the religion itself, the Jews were split in two. There were two, 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 uh, the schism, the first real schism within Judaism. Who were they? The first group, what we would call the Sadducees. The Sadducees were what we call the literalists meaning that they only believed in the written tradition. Okay, because we know that within Judaism today, just I'm going to just, just to, um, give you a little bit of a background of what I'm talking about. I mean, many of you probably know this already. In the Jewish religion, we are the followers of the Torah. Okay, so we know every Saturday morning we take the Torah out, we read it. We know that the Torah is primarily not a, it's not a book of history, but it is a book of rules and regulations, right? It's a contract. It's a contract between God and the Jewish people, basically saying that, you know, you follow my rules, I will give you this and this and this. Okay, so that's what we've done. We follow God's rules and regulations. What are God's rules and regulations? We've come to 613 commandments. We follow the commandments and in return, God takes care of us and we're his chosen people. But in the Torah itself, if you read, it's very difficult to decipher the commandments. I mean, you have a commandment, let's say, about, you know, a mezuzah, putting a mezuzah on the doorpost. Many of us have mezuzahs on the doorpost. What's inside a mezuzah? A scroll. Now, now the mezuzah, the box itself is nothing. I mean, Americans, you know, a lot of Americans think that it's the box that's the most important thing. No, it's a scroll inside. What is the scroll? It's a piece of parchment. And on the parchment is written with a scroll and, uh, and, 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 and a quill two sections of the Torah, the Shema and the second section of the Shema the Vahayim. But it doesn't say it anywhere in the Torah. It doesn't say that. Well, I mean, how, how did we get to having a mezuzah on the doorpost on, a, on, a, on an angle with, with, with written things on a quill? So we believe that there is an oral tradition that came hand in hand with the written tradition. So when Moshe Rabbeinu came down from from the mountain, what happened was that he told Aaron and then his sons and, and then the leaders and the people, hey, we're going to have a mezuzah. Mezuzah? What's that? Well, this is where you're going to do it. You take a piece of parchment. Where do you get parchment from? You, you can't go to Staples. Go to Staples and buy parchment. No, no. you got to get a cow. You get a cow and you get the skin off a cow. You work the skin off the cow. That's parchment. Oh, okay. But you have to first let this cow die first. I mean, it's pretty hard getting the skin off with that, you know. So you let the cow die, you take the skin, you work the skin. That's how you get the parchment. You get the parchment. On the parchment, you have to write it. What do you get? Well, nice, you know, you go to Mr. Waterman, the, 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 the inventor of a, of a fountain pen. No, you got to get a quill. What's a quill? A quill is you take a, a, a chicken feather and you sharpen it up until it comes to a very fine point, And then you get good ink. And on with the quill and the ink, this is how you write the mezuzah. Okay, if that's what you wanted, Moses, fine, have it your way, no problem. All right, but none of this that I just told you is in the Torah. None of it. How do we know this? Because it's an oral tradition that has come down from one generation to another generation to another generation, all the way down to the year zero we find ourselves in today. Now, to believe that, 
you have to have faith that this was this was transmitted properly, right? Because you know, and the old, the old thing is that if we play broken telephone in this room, you know, we, we'd get garbled message. So we have faith and we believe that somehow miraculously, all of the oral tradition, the same way that Moses brought it down from heaven has been passed from one generation to another. And when there's questions, we have what's called a Sanhedrin, you know, a body of 71 rabbis that, that debate and they make questions and give answers. And that's the way Judaism has come back in its perfect form in the year 70. But there were many people that said, are you kidding me? Come on. I mean, there's no way that this could have possibly happened. So what they did is they rejected all of the oral tradition. They believed in the, they believed in the divinity of the Torah. They believed God gave the Torah. But they did not believe, they did not believe in the authority of the rabbis. They rejected the authority of the Sanhedrin. Out. We don't believe that. And they were called Sadducees, named after their founder, Sad, Sad, Sadok. His name was Sadok, or, or uh, uh, in, in England, in, in, probably in Greek, it would be like something like Sadu. And then, so they were just uh, added the E's and the Sadducees. So they were followers of this fellow, all right? And they were re completely rejected the oral tradition. So how did they keep the Torah? They just, whatever it says in them, whatever it says, no light on Shabbos is no light on Shabbos. Meaning now, you know, having someone turn on the light for you, some, you know, a non-Jew or, you know, or other things that, you know, scratch your ear like this, you know, like, for example, thank God for the Sadducees because we have on Shabbos a very delectable dish just because of the Sadducees. And you know what that is? The Cholent. That's right. Thank you very much. The Cholent that we have on Shabbos, that hot dish, is thanks to the Sadducees. Why thanks to the Sadducees? Because the Sadducees argued, no, no, you can't cook anything on Shabbos because you can't have a fire burning. So we, who are the Pharisees, which I will explain in a moment, we who are the Pharisees said, ha ha, watch this, and we made a dish, the dish. Now, of course, it wasn't with beans and potatoes. I'm sure it was something else back then, maybe some tea or whatever it was, but they plugged, they plugged it in or whatever they did over there before Shabbos cooked it. I don't think they plugged it in, but they cooked it before Shabbos and hid it under blankets and pillows and everything to keep it warm, just to show the Sadducees, you are wrong. So thank God today we have a challenge, thanks to those Sadducees. The Sadducees were in political power for a while, because you know what, they were kind of more the uh, enlightened kind. You know what, they refined political power, they knew how to maneuver, you know, so many of them were the high priests because they did believe in the temple service, so many of them were high priests, many of them were in political high positions, you know, they were, they were there, they were a force to be reckoned with. What happened to them was that after the temple was destroyed in 70, they ceased to exist because they were so tied up in the temple service that they could not, after the temple was gone, they lost all focus you know, of where, where they were going, so they completely ceased to exist. We don't find any remnants of them anymore after the year 70. That was it. They basically assimilated. I'm sure many of them became Romans or, you know, many, some, you know, went over to the Pharisees, which I will get to in a minute, and then they just kind of disappeared. Like many, many groups disappear in the, you know, they become, they become part of the general uh, congregation of Jews. The other, the other side was the Pharisees. That's who we are. We are the descendants of the Pharisees. Who were the Pharisees? The Pharisees in Hebrew were called Pirushim. Pirushim means separatists. Why were they called separatists? Because I guess, like, you know, like in every, every group you have to have the, the, somebody and someone who separates themselves. So they were called Pirushim, separate. They were, they, they were careful about the laws of purity and impurity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that's who they were, called the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees you do find in the New Testament that's written about them, not very glowingly, I may add. But, I, I, but don't, don't, don't believe what you read there. Let, let me just say that about, about the, the, the Jewish part. You can believe other things if you want to. I'm going to tell you. But about the Pharisees, they were a group of rabbis that basically formed what we call the Sanhedrin, a body of 71 rabbis that sat in the temple, had an office in the temple, and they were kind of the Supreme Court. They made all the rules and regulations and all of the decisions, and, that's, and they were extremely powerful. So, you know, because when they, when they put out an edict, you know, you had to have a lot of followers, the Pharisees, and basically, huh, you know what, they, uh, people followed them. In the year, not exactly zero, but during Hadrian's reign, he massacred the whole Sanhedrin. Why? Because he wanted something done, the Sanhedrin refused to do it, so he killed the whole Sanhedrin. 
and he had, and he, re, and he, he brought in a new Sanhedrin. He appointed a new Sanhedrin. This new Sanhedrin, you know, uh, found this fellow by the name of Hillel, and he was appointed head of the Sanhedrin. Now, Hillel was somebody that was a very powerful personality. You probably remember him from, from Hebrew school. He made a neely mealy if I'm not for myself, who am I? Hillel was very patient. You know, I mean, there's a lot of legends in the Talmud about Hillel. But Hillel was a very, very powerful, powerful person, very humble, very poor. They tell stories about Hillel, how he couldn't afford even the money to come into a lecture, so he slept on the roof, and it snowed, and they, they saw him on the roof. Yeah, meant a lot of legends about him. But he becomes one of the basic authors of the Talmud. And he forms a house of study that we call the Bet Hillel, the house of Hillel, which the Mishnah and the Talmud is based, is, is, is based upon. So these were people that believed in the oral tradition, kept the oral tradition, expanded the oral tradition, and basically, after the destruction of the temple, kept Judaism going. There was a third group that were called the Essenes. Now, the Essenes, is we know about them from a fellow by the name of Josephus, which we'll talk about in a little bit later on, because you know he becomes a major player in the war, you know, against the, against the Romans. But he tells us about this group called the Essenes that somehow are not part of the general populace. Because if you walk through Jerusalem, who you would find, you know, a Pharisee, you would see them dressed in a certain way, a little bit better dressed, you could probably figure it's a Sadducee. There was other kind of people running around, but the Essenes lived out in the desert. For those who went to the Dead Sea Scrolls, if you, if you, you know, went with us um, last summer to see the Dead Sea Scrolls, it talked a lot about the Essene community in Qumran, because that's supposedly where they were supposed to live. Men, maybe the Dead Sea Scrolls were written by an Essene community. We don't know, no one is certain for sure, but they basically were really, if, we, if you think that the, the Perushim, the Pharisees were separatists, these guys were completely out. And they dressed in white, they, they, they were very into much of the purity. They, they went to the mikveh every, every day, meaning they immersed themselves in, in a ritual bath, you know, every day. They prayed long, you know. They, it, was, it was a community that basically didn't want to associate because they were afraid of the temptations of civilization or whatever reason. They felt, hey, you know what? We're better off being away. And that's the way, basically, that's the way they lived. We don't hear from them anymore. Again, after, after the destruction of the temple, they seems basically go. I mean, they, they, take, they, they become a little bit important in Western civilization, not really in Judaism, because they make very, very little difference in Jewish history, but in Christian history, because supposedly John the Baptist was an Essene. Now, it, 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 who could prove it? I mean, there's, you know, whether he was or whether he wasn't. I mean, there was no, no CNN back then, and there was no, no tape recorders, and no one was filming, no YouTube. I mean, could you believe that? I, I can't believe it, but I mean, I mean that's what they, the rumor was, that there was none of this YouTube or Google back then. So we don't know whether he was or whether he wasn't, but at least it sounds good that he was in the desert, and he wasn't that. And then, of course, he meets Jesus, and, and, and the rest, of course, is history and changes Western, you know, Western civilization, you know, as we know it. But besides that, uh, nothing really much happened with the Essenes, you know. But again, these are the three major groups that are now within living within Israel, and somehow, you know, there was always friction between the Sadducees and the Pharisees over who has the right to determine law. They say we have a right, you have a right, we have a right. You know, I think politics, like in every show, that like we know, I mean, who has a right to make the decisions? The rabbi or the board? The board says it's them. The rabbi says it's them. And no one likes to canter. You know, that's the way basically. That's the basically how it goes. You know, in every congregation, you know, in Jewish congregation. So why should we be any different over there? But, but, and here's the big but. Within these groups, there's forming now a fourth faction. There's forming now a fourth faction. This faction, even though they will not number many, but you don't need much if you're in the right place. I mean, just leverage is what it's called. If you have enough leverage, you don't need to be a membership of 10 million people. You have them in the right places at the right time and in the right place, you can make a major difference in history. Now, just in general, I forgot to give you the introduction as we always talk about the introduction. To get into history, to get into the history books, if you want to get into the history books, because if you think about it, how many people do we talk about in history? Take all of history of the entire world. 20,000 people are mentioned. 
30,000 people are mentioned in every history book. Take Chinese, Indian, Western, American, Incan, doesn't make a difference. 50,000 people are mentioned in history books. Think about how many people are lived. Billions, billions of people. So how, how do you get lucky enough to be mentioned or at least be remembered in the history book? It takes four criterias, right? First criteria is you have to be very smart. I mean, I get into history, I mean, a guy like Alexander the Great or others like that, you've got to be smart. B, you've got to be very committed to your cause. Very, very committed. You can't take losing easily. You've got to be up and at it, up and at it again. You know, you've got to be determined that you're going to, you're, you're, you know, you're going to succeed. You're going to succeed, you're going to succeed. And the most important thing is, the wind has to be blowing your way. If the wind is not blowing your way, you could forget about it. Thomas Edison in the year 70 would have not have done much. Wouldn't, wouldn't have done much. Now, he could have been the most brilliant guy, but in the year 70 AD, <coughs> no one was ready for a, a light bulb. I mean, you know, they were barely figuring out how to plow and, you know, and do all of that stuff. Forget, you know, forget about a light bulb. So you have to have the wind blowing in your favor. So if all of these, if you have these criteria, so you're smart and you're determined and the wind is blowing in your way and all of that stuff, then you know what? Then history is going to be kind to you and you're going to actually write because who actually writes history? The victors. The victors always write history. That's the way it goes. History is never objective. Don't believe that for a second. There's a thing called objective history. History is always written by the people that win the wars. When Jews write history, they write history well, like we the, we, the way we want to write history. When someone else wins a war, they write history the way, no, they write their history. So here is a fourth group that is starting to ferment. It's not really a religious group, it's more a political group, of which Judaism was not really used to having. I mean, we never really were involved in politics, because Israel was never, a, it was always a theocracy. Israel was run by a king, and Israel was run by the Sanhedrin, and Israel, that's the way it's run, it's run by a theocracy. So here, in this, 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 this political um, growth is now starting. Now, why are these people getting so, some sort of attention? Because if you believe, if you believe the basic premise of what Judaism stands for, and that is what? That we are the chosen people, that God gave us the Torah, Remember, this is before Christianity, before Islam. I mean, we are the people that carry the banner of monotheism. We are the most religious people on earth, right? We recognize one God, the strongest God. The if that's true, then what are we doing in this kind of situation? Why are we paying taxes to Rome? Why do we have Roman centurions walking the streets and Roman soldiers walking the streets of Jerusalem? Why are we not independent? We need to be independent. We need to get rid of the Romans. And these people are, be, are called in the Talmud, Biryoinim, outlaws, okay? You could call them radicals, activists, militants, whatever it is you can call them, but they are starting to ferment what is now known as La Revolution, right? Yeah, okay, so if you're on their side, you think of them as Shay, the original, you know, hey, hey, you know, uh, Castro and Shay and all of those guys. Whoop de do, you know, revolutionaries getting rid of the Romans. If you're a guy that's tied in and the Romans are buying a lot of your wood that you're producing, you look at them like, what the heck is going on here? Shut up, you know, we're living, no one is bothering us, keep quiet and, you know, be still. But who are they gaining support from? Who do you normally get support from? Three separate groups, right? One, poor people. I got nothing to lose. You get rid of the Romans, you got nothing to lose. Two, students. Students, yeah? Your college students are always going to be interested in a revolution, right? Better than going to class, huh? Isn't it better? Sit-ins, pile-ins, whatever it is, with this, students always ready to, to them. And three, academics, right? Academics, because academics, you know, are there any professors here in the room tonight? <laughs> No, okay, good. Because academics have all the time in the world, right? They don't have a real job, right? They don't have a real job. But wait, 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 professors. Professors come, they sit all day, think like this for a few hours, and then come tell their students what they think about, go back to sitting and thinking. So, you know, if, you're a, if, you're, if, you, if you happen to be a person that works, you don't have time for a revolution. You know, you've got to get up in the morning, you've got to make a living, you've got to go back to work, you've got to you know, pay the bills. But professors have tenure, they had tenure back then too, no, not really, but they had ten. You know, so, so you have these groups that are all now joining what they call a revolution. And you know, all you need is two, three, 
very, uh, uh, um, very uh, uh, popular and charismatic people to ferment this revolution, then you need the Romans to do something really, really, really stupid. And what do you have? You got yourself a, 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 a powder box full of TNT. And all it takes, once there's already that everything is moving, bingo. All it takes is one spark to blow everything sky high. Now, in theory, it sounds great. Who wants to live under dominion of somebody else? No one wants to live under someone else's subjugation. We all, everybody wants to be free. Everybody wants to write their own thing. Okay, so, but you pay a price for that. You're gonna pay a price. But, you know what? People believed in the Messiah, okay? People believed, they, 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 they felt the Messiah is coming. Something is gonna happen. I mean, the Romans are here, the temple is here. I mean, Herod is crazy. The things, things are moving at a very rapid pace right now. You know, so something is gonna go on. Something is gonna happen. And if something's gonna happen, where do you look to? You look at the Torah. And what does the Torah say? You'll read, you have to read Isaiah, and you read Amos, and you read Obadi, and you read all of those. What then, Zechariah, what do they tell you? That at the end of days, what's gonna happen? Messiah is coming. Now, when you have the Messiah complex, when you believe that the Messiah is coming any day now, that could move mountains. Why? Because now, not only are you going to wait for the Messiah, you're going to do something to bring the Messiah. And if that's Armageddon, hey, what, what better than that? Right? So you have, you know, if you, we, we read over, over Sukkot, we read about the story of the Mogog and Mogog, the war that God is going to finally strike down the last, who better than the Romans? Who better than the Romans to be Gog and Mogog, the suppressors, our occupiers here? So they begin to ferment. Now, many of the, the Sanhedrin was against going to war, very much against going to war, because they like the status quo. What's wrong with the status quo? The Romans are, you know, freedom of religion, which they didn't have under the Greeks when Antiochus was forcing them to, to you know, to worship idols here. No one was forcing them to worship idols. No one was forcing them to work on Shabbos. They can do whatever they want. The Sadducees certainly were against the war. I mean, the Sadducees were in, you know, were in tight with the Romans and they were in the temple and all of that stuff. But when things start rolling your way, and again, I can't, I can't stress this enough, when things are rolling your way, they just stay out of the way and let, let it pass. It's like a tsunami. And this is what happened. The Romans are expanding. They're always continuously expanding, because you got it. I mean, if you're a new emperor, well, you know, unless you're some you know, interim guy that's only gonna be there for a week or two, but if you wanna make your name in history, Trajan and all these guys, what do you gotta do? Conquer. You wanna make it bigger, you wanna make it stronger. You wanna, you wanna do it. What do, you, what do you need for that? What do you need? An army, right? First thing is you need an army. How do you get an army? Pay money, taxes. Who are you going to tax? Your subjects. You're going to tax your subjects. Who are your subjects? The people living in Judea. Okay? So now we have a situation here that the Romans are now coming and clamping down really, really hard on the Jews. They're really coming down on them, squeezing them. Now this is not a rich community. I'm sure there were people that were rich, you know, of course, that, that, kept, that, 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 that had, had a lot of money. But for the average person, it was very difficult. And who were the tax collectors? Jews themselves. The Jews themselves were the tax collectors. We have story upon story in the Talmud how people squeezed the other Jews, and the Romans did it very, uh, very, very uh, intelligently. They went to somebody in the community, they said, who would like to make a good living? Who doesn't want to make a good living? Eh, me, I'd like to make a good living. Okay, Pearl Mother, you're in charge of Long Beach. We need out of Long Beach $100,000. Get us $100,000, and you take, 5%. All right, what's so bad with that? $5,000 in those days? It would be, would be, would be if you count inflation, it was a, a lot of money. So I go around and I start collecting. I start making a list of everybody in Long Beach and I say, okay, you, $1,000, $2,000, $3,000, $5,000, dollars everybody down the list. Okay, you know what? And you start paying, but you pay it grudgingly. Why well, I'm paying, but I'm the collector. Okay, then I figure to myself the next year, why do I only have to make 5%? Let me make 10%, the Romans are not going to know. So now I can get you 1,500, you 2,500, you 3,500, okay? And more and more and more. Why 10%? Why not 15%? So the, 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 the tax collectors were hated, hated, hated people. Hated people. 
You know, because, because it, 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 it was very difficult to pay. And if you didn't pay, they took your land. And if you took your land, they put you in prison. You know, it was, it was a horrible situation. What did that do? That gave fuel to which group? Did it give fuel to the Sadducees, the ones that were comfortably hanging around the Romans? No. Did it give, uh, did it give, uh, did, it, did, it, did it give any uh, support to the Pharisees that were the rabbinates and said, hey, let's all daven mincha and let's you know, keep, keep the peace? No. Who did it give strength to? The revolutionaries. It gave strength to the revolutionaries. And they began to gather arms and they began to organize militias and all it took was one little incident, and that's what it was. That's, that, that, that's, that's basically what it, what it is. So you have now in Jerusalem the tension I can't even begin to tell you, because, because even among the revolutionaries, it wasn't one united body. It wasn't you had one guy who was leading the charge. They had little different groups of revolutionaries. Now, some people like to join the radicals. You know why? Because it gives them an opportunity to steal. Hey, hey, you know, we're poor guys. Uh, what's that guy in the in Sherwood Forest? What's his name? Uh, Robin. Robin. How did Robin Hood make his money? Oh, he didn't. Oh, he didn't actually build actually a business. Like, you know, and invest, you know, a 401k plan. And then, you know, and reinvested. And, you know, and had, and had helping and this. No, 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 no. Robin Hood became a hero because he did what? Thank you very much. He, the first part is more important. Whether he gave it to the poor is immaterial. He, you know what? He actually stole from the rich. He actually went ahead and was a bandit, right? He was a bandit and stole from the rich. Now, maybe he had every right to steal from the rich. Maybe ever, but he was, he was a robber. Basically, Robin Hood was a robber. And the same thing that gave these people an opportunity to become robbers, biryanim, that they went ahead and just stole in the name of, hey, you know, we're going to set you free, baby. You know, just... No, but they, be, they become outlaws. So the outlaws were fighting the revolutionaries, the revolutionaries and the militants, you know, all were one after another. Okay. But finally, what happened was, is that there was a story, whether this story is, 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 is true, but it's apocryphal, certainly, in the sense that there was some children that were out there with, with the charity boxes, even that charity boxes even back then, the Jewish National Fund, and they were collecting, and you know, when the governor, who was at the time in, in, uh, in Jerusalem, got very angry, because the kids were collecting money, and he forbade them from collecting charity, had them killed. So one Friday, the Roman uh, guards were chasing these kids in Jerusalem, and they killed them, and that night in Shul, that was all they needed to hear. Okay? That was all the revolutionaries needed. And they said, this is enough. We've taken it up to here. The blood of our children are on our hands. And they said, we're going for it. And you know what? Sometimes it's better to be lucky than smart. Okay? Because their tactics, let's say, weren't the greatest. But you caught the Romans by surprise. Because the Romans never, ever figured that they would do this. And they rose up and they attacked the Romans in three separate areas. In the north, in the north, and in the, and, and in the, and in the west, and in Jerusalem. And guess what? In the beginning, they were unbelievably successful. And he claims, and this is where Josephus comes in, because you could read all about this in the war against the Romans, that he was actually a general. His name was Matis Yahu, HaKohen. He was a, from the priestly family, and he was one of the generals in the north, and he was very successful. And you had others in Gush Chalav, and you had a bunch of... Um, 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 what was his name? His name, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Josephus was Yosef ben Matis Yahu, HaKohen. No, not Matasio, Yosef, Ben Matasio, Cohen, And you had, and it was unbelievable. It was incredible. They actually drove the Romans out of Jerusalem. I mean, all the Romans said, goodbye. They drove the Romans out of the north. They drove the Romans out of the west. They were victorious. And they thought to themselves, oh my God. You know what, because in victory, it's hard to realize it, but in victory, you're almost as shocked as if you are in defeat. You don't know what to do. So they all gathered back in Jerusalem, and they said, okay, what are we going to do now? Now that we, 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 have to, let's, we have to keep fighting. Otherwise, what, what good is a revolutionary if he doesn't fight? You have to keep fighting, right? I've always said, you know, that you could never make peace with Yasser Arafat. You could never make peace with Yasser Arafat. Not because of the fact that he hated Jews and was, a, and was an anti-Semite and he always prayed for the destruction of Israel. But the fact is that Yasser Arafat made his living doing what? Fighting. Right? Yasser Arafat was not interested in building roads in the West Bank. Yeah. He wasn't interested in sewer systems, okay? He was interested in fighting. 
That's all he knew. That's how he started. That's how he made his claim to fame. And the moment this fighting ended, okay, so, so the next day, he's sitting, you know, he's, he's sitting in the West Bank. Now he's the head of the PA, you know, and they have all this so, so, semi, semi-autonomous government. Okay, where is my trash not picked up, Yasser? You know, my toilet is backed up, Yasser. Hey, you know, the roads is, you know, who? Who bought into this? I got to kill, that's my job. I mean, I, you, know, I'm, you know, I'm a revolutionary. That, that's, that, that's what I got to do. And the same thing is with these people. Revolutionaries after the what? Fight, fight, fight. We mentioned Shea before, right? Che Guevara was a guy that fought where? Everywhere, right? Now, whether you like him or not, I couldn't mean we're not, we're not, there's not a class on, 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 on the Marxist, uh, you know, things of, of Che Guevara, teach leanings of Che Guevara, but he was the ultimate in revolutionary. He ran to, to, he ran to Congo, he fought there. He ran to Cuba, he fought there. He ran to Bolivia, died there. You know, I mean, that was it. I mean, he had, had, he, had he been successful in Bolivia, he would have kept going, because that's, that's basically what you do. He was the same way. Now the Romans, at first, were very surprised. They were shocked because you know, like uh, David and Goliath. You remember that story from when you went to Hebrew school and David picked up the rock and slew and hit Goliath in the head. But you know what they say? In a rematch, the good money is on Goliath. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Think about that for a second. In a rematch, the good money is on Goliath because the first time he caught him by surprise. Okay, and that's what they did. They caught the Romans by surprise. The Romans were not ready, you know, to fight. They were well armed, and more than that, they had home court advantage because this is Judea. That's where they lived. And number three, they fought for a purpose while the Romans. So the Romans decided, okay, you know what? Oh, we can't afford to lose this war because if you lose this war, what's going to happen? What, what do they call it in the Vietnam War? What was it? The, 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 the what? Domino. The domino theory, right? The domino theory. Judea gets free, Egypt gets free, next, everybody's going to get free. So they sent in one of their most powerful and experienced generals by the name of Vespasian. And Vespasian came to Israel with nine legions. I mean, you know, they're talking about a tremendous amount of force. And what he did was, he figured, hey, you know what? The Jews may have home court advantage, but we got time on our side because we got the money and we got the soldiers. And slowly but surely, very methodically, he didn't rush in and like in a, like, like in a blitzkrieg like they did in World War II. He went very methodically from the north and cut them up piece by piece, meaning he took one city, boom, then another city and fell and kept going and going until he came to Jerusalem. That means he had wiped everybody else out, captured, exiled the generals, killed the generals, or whatever he had to do, until he laid siege to Jerusalem, the last stronghold of, 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 of Jewish resistance. Now, one of the people that was captured was this fellow by the name of Yosef ben Matis Yahu, who later becomes known as Josephus. And of course, you can always, uh, historians have always had this quasi feeling about Josephus because you never know what he's writing is true, because now he's writing as a Roman citizen. See, he's, now he's writing in Rome because he's kicked back to Rome and he's writing all about Rome and the war. You know, makes himself look, <laughs> you know, I was a general. He may have been, uh, you know, some buck private, you know, schlepping food for the general. You know, who, you know, who knows, you know, what, what, what it was like over there. But nonetheless, he writes the history of the Jewish people. Vespasian surrounds Jerusalem. And here we have an interesting, an interesting story in the Talmud that tells us what happened. Within Jerusalem, there lived three people that they themselves personally were able to sustain the community of Jerusalem for 20 years. There was enough oil and enough wood and enough wheat to keep going for 20 years they could have, they could have stayed there. But you know what happened? They burned down the warehouses. Who burned down the warehouses? Was it the Romans? No. It was the zealots. It was the revolutionaries. They burned down the warehouses. Why? Because <laughs> We're not sitting here for 20 years waiting for the Romans to come in. This is a war, baby, and either we do it or we don't do it. Either we go down fighting or we don't go down. You know, and you can't talk to them. I mean, the rabbis had begged them, sat with them, tried to negotiate with them. There's no one negotiating with them. So once they burned down the storehouses, that was it, it was finished. Rome laid siege to Jerusalem, and there's no food coming in, and there's no food going out. And slowly but surely, starvation is coming upon the Jewish people. I mean, I mean, and that's, that, that's, that's what happens under a siege. A fellow by the name of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, one of the leaders of the Pharisees, tells his students, listen, I've got to get out of here. 
I got to get this. I got to do something because if I don't do this, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be finished. We're all going to die here. So he gets himself. They put a rumor he died. They put him in this coffin and they get him out of Jerusalem. He gets to see Vespasian. He's in Vespasian's tent. He's right there within Vespasian's tent. And he, t he goes to Vespasian, Hail to thee, Caesar! Hail to thee, Caesar! He says, You know what? You say that to me. You are what we call Meirid B'Malchus. You are a rebel against the Caesar in Jerusalem. How could you call me Caesar? I'm, I'm a general Vespasian. At that very moment, when he's saying that to Rabbi Yechonim and Zakkai, a messenger runs in and says, Hail to thee! See, the Caesar died and the Senate has just elected you the new Caesar. Oh, so he saw that this is a very special man. That Rabbi Yechonim and Zakeh has some insight that no one else had. So he says to him, my friend, not my friend, but he says to him, what can I do for you? He says, I have three requests for you. Basically three requests. One is, I want to heal. There was a fellow by Rabbi Tzadok, a great sage who was fasting for many years over the destruction of the temple. I want him to be healed. Number two, I want you not to kill the house of Hillel because that they were the leadership of the Sanhedrin. I want you to let them live. And number three, I want to be able to move the Sanhedrin to what we to a city called Yavne, which is a little bit north of Jerusalem. Tenli, as it says in the Talmud, Tenli Yavne v'chachameho. Give me Yavne and the sages to live in Yavne. Okay, so. Vespasian says, yeah, pff, that's all he wants. They have some hill and the Fine. In the Talmud, they ask, why didn't he ask for more? Why didn't he ask for the Romans just to take off? Why didn't he leave us alone and, 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 and leave? It says, because he knew that you can't ask them. When you can ask them for too much, they're going to give you nothing. So basically, what happened is Vespasian left. His son Titus later goes back to Rome. We all know that the, the arch, arch of Titus, if you go to Rome, he walks in with the menorah. He takes over and he lays siege to Jerusalem. A bloody battle occurs. Bloody battle occurs. They fight valiantly. They try to protect Jerusalem as much as they possibly can. But on the year Tishabov, in the middle of the summer of the year 70, the, the temple is completely destroyed. The temple is burnt down. We have Tisha B'Av. We all know what Tisha B'Av is. The ninth day of all. We fast on Tisha B'Av. It's a black day within, within Judaism. That's exactly the date. August the 7th, year 70, which brings us to the first date. The destruction of the temple that is, ends all hope for the Jewish people of ever again seeing some kind of a, you know, rebuilding of, you know, of the commonwealth. Now, what happens afterwards? What happens? The Jews, of course, are very much in despair. I mean, you know, because they, 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 they believed, they fervently believed that the Messiah was going to come. I mean, you know, come on. I mean, if any time God should have sent the Messiah, it's now. After the Romans beat, beat us up, I mean, I, I, they, they say close to 900,000 Jews were killed in the war of 66, 70. I mean, that's a tre tremendous number of Jews. There may have been only 5 to 6 million Jews living, or maybe 10 million. You know, it's a tremendous amount of Jews that died. Even if it's an exaggeration, even 500,000 Jews are, are killed. It's still a lot, you know, it's still a, a lot of Jews. So if ever there was this opportunity of God to show the world, hey! I'm the boss like he did back in the, in, in the Torah when he showed Pharaoh. You think you're running the show? I'm running the show. Here, here's, here's some frogs for you. You know, here's some pestilence. Here's a little bit of, uh, here's some other grasshoppers. You know, here's, this time it didn't happen. But, but, but what happened is, is now, now what happens when the temple gets destroyed, the remnants of the people, they really begin to believe, aha, God wanted to show the world, now you know what, you could take down my temple, you could destroy my temple, you could exile my people, but, but wait, I'm going to pull the last trick is going to be for me. I'm going to do it. Watch this. So you can imagine if we were living in the year 70, okay, maybe we, we stayed in Jerusalem, maybe we stayed in Judea, you know, we, we rebuilt our homes or whatever it was, we started to figure out that, you know what, we're not going to be independent types. But one thing became very obvious to us, that this fervent belief in the coming of the Mashiach, because there's no way that Judaism could exist. How could Judaism exist without a temple? The whole, read the Chumash. Every second rule is, 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 is connected to the temple. 
You have to bring sacrifice to the temple. You have to go to Jerusalem three times a year. The Kohanim, the, the priests, where are they going to work? What, are they going to sit home all day? It's bad enough they sat 50 weeks at home. Now they're going to sit 54 weeks at home? You know, forget about it. You know what, this, is, this was incredible. No one could come to grips with this, except Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. He figured, hey, you know what, if Mashiach comes good, if Mashiach doesn't come, we still got to move on. We, we still got to live. So he, he, you know, he took the, the Sanhedrin from Jerusalem, moved them to this place called Yavne, and reestablished Judaism. And said, you know what, we're going to have a Judaism even without a temple. How do you have a Judaism without a temple? Well, everything that we did in the temple, we're just going to substitute for prayer. That's what we're going to do. On the Shalom of Svarim Sosenu, take our lips as substitutes for the bullocks that we sacrificed. So they instituted prayer, and they instituted three times prayer a day, and they got shows to be built up, and they did all of the things. What they basically did was recalibrated Judaism. They said, hey, you know what? The temple was a, was, was a building. Bricks, mortar, wood. Judaism is a spirit. Judaism is an ideal. This is what has to keep living on. But still, he couldn't damper the whole, this whole idea that Mashiach has got to be right there. Now, what was the Messiah? What is the purpose of the Messiah? The purpose of the Messiah was to reestablish his God's dominion over the world. Not only in Israel, but in the world that some guy is going to fly down from a cloud and he's going to come in either on a cloud or on a donkey and he's going to whip you know, Jews into a frenzy and he's going to destroy all the evildoers in the entire world and he's going to establish God's dominion forever and ever. And the whole world, from China to Argentina, from Alaska to Vladivostok, that's not too far apart, but I'm saying from, from, from Alaska to wherever, to South Africa, are all going to know that the Jewish God is the one and true God. That's what the Mashiach is going to do. He has to do it. Otherwise, what are we going to do? Be stuck over here. Sixty years later, another war ensues. The war of Bar Kokhba, because Bar Kokhba becomes Shimon Bar Kokhba, is on one of these char charismatic leaders, and you know, he, 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 he capitalizes on this frenzy, on this mess messianic fervor, and he gathers a 200,000 man army and fights again against the Romans, and again is initially successful. Because Romans says, come on, yeah, again you're gonna fight with us. So and again they put down, and this time it's Hadrian that puts down the revolt, but this time they really smash the Jews. They exile all the Jews out of Jerusalem. This is in the year 130. In 135, they exile all the Jews out of out of out of Jerusalem. They lower the Temple Mount 1,000 feet. He literally squashes the Temple Mount 1,000 feet. Changes the name of Jerusalem. It's called now Ayala Kapitalana. You know, Israel is no more called Judea. It's called Palestina. Now it's called Palestine. You know, for Israel. And basically, he forbids anybody from moving to Jerusalem. I mean, the sages, there's a story in the Talmud that Rabbi Kiva's walking with sages, and he sees a fox, a fox running through the Temple Mount. They start crying. I mean, a fox. I mean, imagine where, where once upon a time the high priest was going there. There's been many other stories. They see garbage. They loaded up the whole Temple Mount with garbage. I mean, everything they could do to squash any Jewish fervor was done. So from that time, if you think about it, from the year 135 till 1948, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's a how many years? More than 100 years. All close to 2,000 years, close to 2,000 years, the Jews never fought another war. Never fought another war. That was it. Never picked up guns, never picked up anything, no weapons, you know, never, never did anything until 1948 when they fought the War of Independence to Israel. But always in the heart of the Jew was beating this ideal, the Techazen and Eno Meshuv Cholitziyah, that one day we're going we're gonna to return to Zion. One day we're going to return to Zion. Now, there was another development that was happening at this very moment, and that was a development, and it had a major impact on Judaism, was Christianity, the rise of Christianity. Now, we could only talk about the rise of Christianity from a Jewish perspective. Um, well, of course, not, it's not our, it's not our um, mission here to talk about, you know, if you want to read about Jesus and his followers, I mean, there's plenty of books that you could, you know, could read out there. Let me tell you, that Jesus was not the only Messiah running around. Everybody and his mother was a Messiah. I mean, everybody was a Messiah. He just got lucky, had tremendous good press. And I think personally, he had something that nobody else had. Paul, like I have my Paul, he had his Paul, all right? He, his Paul changed the face of Christianity. Literally changed the face of Christianity. 
Because if you read the New Testament, which I'm not encouraging you to do, but if you read the New Testament, you will find that Paul has, I think, which is really, really, this is the, the apex, this is the, 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 the crossroads, this is where Christianity really has to face its major first test. It's where in the book of Acts, Paul has this disagreement with the leaders of the Jerusalem church, with Peter and James about conversions. I know Peter and James are hearing that Paul is making conversions outside of Israel and he's converting Gentiles without having them first convert to Judaism. They call him back and they say, Chutzpah, you know, Jesus was a Jew and all that. How do we know that Jesus was a Jew? You know how? Well, okay, listen, he lived at home till he was 30. Okay? His mother thought he was God and he went into his father's business. So right away, those are the three proofs that Jesus was, was Jewish. But here was a here, so they call him back and they say to Paul, hey, what are you doing? Paul says, okay, you know what? I am, from my understanding of, 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 of the writings, you don't have to be, you don't have to convert to be a Christian. Anybody can be a Christian. A Gentile can be a Christian too. And his, you know, his, uh, his, his, his ideas won over. And guess what? Within a matter of 300 years, the Roman Empire was, a, was Christian, was Christian. Now, Within Israel itself, there was what they called a Jewish Christian church. What by Peter? Peter was Jewish, and you know, and James, Jesus' brother, was Jewish. So there was a there was a Jewish Christian church. What happened to the Jewish Christians after the destruction of the temple? They completely disappeared. There's no remnants anymore of you know of, of a Jewish Christian church. Either they completely assimilated within the greater Christian community, or they went back to some probably went back to Judaism. But Christianity, which started which basically started as a root from within Judaism. I mean, what was what what did Jesus say? Jesus came along to talk. He was a Jewish guy. He was a Jewish man, and then preached the coming of the Messiah, and then this and that, and A, B, C, and D. Now forget about what they made of him later on. But just walking down the streets, I mean, maybe he was a heretic in the sense that said, "I'm I'm the Messiah." Could be. Who knows? It's 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 hard to judge at that time. But Christianity certainly started only as a branch. From Judaism, I mean, it didn't come to change anything. I mean, it's, I didn't come to change a, a you know, a letter or or or, or, a, or a, a dot, you know, from the commandments. Later, became completely bifurcated. I mean, the early church fathers completely cut off any remnants. They didn't want to know about Judaism. They didn't care about Judaism. They 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 incorporated the Old Testament as if it's their book. I mean, claiming that all of the prophets, Isaiah, and everything that we talked about the coming of the Messiah was fulfilled in this man called Jesus of Nazareth. And not only did they become bifurcated from Judaism, they, many of them became outright anti-Semitic because it was a very simple thing. And this is really how it, one of the key elements within Jewish history. Why would they become anti-Semitic? Why do you think? Because the Lord was killed on a cross. A very angry Lord, right? I mean, Jesus did not die in bed surrounded by his family with a big smile on his face, right? How did Jesus die? In agony, right? What was his last words? Kaylee, Kaylee, Lomas of Tony. God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right? Why have you forsaken me? I mean, if you take the, take all of the religious connotation out of this, this is a man that's in pure agony on a cross and praying to God, why he forsake? And who killed him? Who? Not who killed him? The Jews. The Jews killed him, right? The Jews killed him. Because that, 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 that was the word that was spread around. The Jews gave him up. Let me read the book of Matthew. If you go watch Mel Gibson's uh, lovely little film there, a real family get together. You know, if you want to have a nice, nice hot chocolate and some popcorn, you know, rent that. You know, it's a real nice film. You know what? You see, you see what, 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 what it's all about. And it was the Jews that did it. It was the Jews that gave him up. Now, there's also a theological underpinning to anti-Semitism. It's not only cultural. It's not racial. You, you must be infected by the devil, right? You must be infected by the devil, or we're wrong. So what do you think they chose? Exactly. Thank you very much. That the Jews were the sons and daughters of the devil. They had to be. Otherwise, how could they reject us? The God's only gift, his greatest gift to the world, by sending his only beloved son to die for their sins on the cross. So the Jews definitely had to be infected by some sort of a virus, some sort of a virus, and we had to get rid of them. So the, even the early church fathers, starting from early on, wrote edicts against the Jews. I mean, basically saying, you know, don't they, they don't let synagogues be built. You know, don't don't let Jews, uh, you know, hire Christian people. The intermarriage was forbidden. All of these things. Why? Because there was something 
innately wrong with them. They're crazy people. Not only they're crazy, they're dangerous people. They're dangerous. And when he came along, the great bishop of um, um, uh, of, of, of Hippo, um, uh, what's his name? He wrote the City of God. The, the, oh, let's, I'll figure this out in a second. See, when, when, your, when your memory is uh, obstacle, it's not, 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 not so good anymore. You remember him? The great Christian theologian. What's his name? Come on. Fourth century. Yeah. What century? The fourth century. What's his name? Ah, 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 come on. I can't go on till I, till I figure this out. Okay. What's his name? He has, he's a Christian theologian. He's one of the most famous Christian bishops of that period. He lived in the fifth century. <laughs> He lived in the fifth century. I'm gonna find, I, have, I think I have his name down here. Not he lived in the fifth century. He lived in the fifth century, that's right. What is his name? His name is not Constantine. I know, we're gonna think of his name, I'll tell you. Once I say his name, you're gonna know right away who, you know who I'm talking about. It starts with H. It starts with something between A and Z. Something like that. Something between A, a and Z. You know what? You, I'll, I, you know, you know how that something it'll, it, it'll flash and give us all a call at three in the morning. I, exactly. You know exactly. You know I'll do that. Um, aha. It starts with an A. I remember. Come on. A. A U. A U G. Thank you very much. Augustine. God, everybody heard of Saint Augustine. I mean, you know, Saint Augustine was one of the one of the great early church church fathers, and you know, wrote. But he wrote in his book, and and, and gave a gave a, an answer to why do Jews why are Jews still around if they're the sons and daughters of the devil? Why are they still around? Because he called them the witnesses that Jews needed to be around, because when Jesus does come back, someone has to proclaim, "I made a mistake." I was there and I made a mistake. Witness. See, the Christians, they're ready to accept the Jesus. So big deal. But the Jew has to be there. There's got to be at least five, ten Jews that are going to be around that are going to say, hey, I, me, we made a mistake. Katosi, Avisi, Pashati, like on Yom Kippur, we say we made a mistake. Yes, he's back. And that's why Jews were around. And for many years, until Hitler's times, where we had what they called the Pope's Jews, that the Pope was always protecting a group of Jews, just in case, just in case Jesus shows up. He's gonna say, hey, he needs a minion, because what do you think Jesus, when he died, like he prayed in, uh, he's not gonna go to the Vatican, what do you think, that's not, no Latin or, or anything, he prayed in uh, Hebrew, he knew. So he's gonna want a minion, what is he, uh, what's he gonna do over there with the Latin mass? So he's, he's gonna need a minion, so they had 10 Jews waiting for him to, to now that just came up, but that not that'd be a big deal. I better write that down. Just, <laughs> Jesus needs minion. I could, I could somehow, you know, shake the underpinnings of the whole Roman Catholic Church, you know, by, by, by spreading out this rumor, you know, something like that. You know, I'm telling. I think they, they may be. Oh, oh, oh. So therefore, he comes along and he says this, and you know what? So, but Jews under this, under in this time, were now living under Christian dominion because we all know what happened. You know, skip a few hundred years to Constantine, the great emperor, Roman emperor. We know that Constantine's mother was a fervent Christian and she always kept bugging Constantine to, to, to convert, to convert, to convert. And what happened was Constantine, yeah, say, come on, it's so much easier being a pagan. It's so much more fun. You can kill and steal and rape and pillage and do all of that stuff. If you're a Christian, you have to be nice and all of that stuff the theoretically. But you know what happened? In one of the wars against his arch enemy, you know what he saw the night before, he was standing outside and he saw this cross in the sky and, he, and, and the cross was written, with this you shall win. And he had all of his soldiers put a cross on their shields. And if he had lost, it may have been a different story, but he won and he converted to Christianity. And not only did he convert to Christianity, he made Christianity the official Roman Empire, religion of the Roman Empire. And by the, by, by, by the year already 400, more than, more than 60, 70 percent of the Roman Empire were all Christians. I mean, if you think about that, I mean, had we just, you know, did a little bit different, we would have been not proselytizing. We would be two billion Jews today, but uh, that's not to be because we are very special. We're like diamonds. We're not common like everybody else. Two billion Jews, come on. We have a few million, but we're special. We're special. All right, well, 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 till the Mashiach comes, we'll accept that as the answer. But when he comes, oh, am I going to ask him? Oh, you know, a lot of different questions, you know, of what was going on. So here we find one of, one of the great 
turning points within Jewish history is certainly the destruction of the Second Temple. Not so much also because it ended a whole whole idea of temple service and the Sadducees disappeared and the Essenes disappeared, etc. But it gave Judaism a new idea and a new life because what the Sanhedrin did afterwards is they started to incorporate things that would make the community stronger. That means every community got stronger. Here, when everybody's looking towards Jerusalem, so the focal point is Jerusalem. Now that Jews are living all over the, 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 the empire without a focal point, what happens is that everybody grows stronger. And scholarship began to flourish. Because what happens? Till, till Israel was in existence, you had people that were busy working with you know, politics and this and the temple and back. But now all your greatest minds were dedicated to do what? They had nothing else to do. All they did was study. So after the year 70, you know, starting from seven, or really starting from the year 200, because you got to give a little time for, for, for Bar Kokhba to be, you know, to be, uh, this, uh, to be defeated and the, the Jews to be exiled. But in Babylon now, where, where a lot of the Jews are living, great academies are springing up. Great learning academies are springing up. And the fact that we are called the people of the book comes from where? From this very essence of being. This very essence of our existence now is no more a people living in Israel, you know, founded and surrounded by a temple, but now we are in exile, living under foreign dominion, and we got used to it. You know, hey, you know, we're living under whoever it is, whether it's pagans, whether it's Muslims, whether it's Christians, we're living under there, and guess what? We are now flourishing. We're flourishing. You can't imagine the scholarship that comes out of this era. It's just unreal you know what happens over here because you have these yeshivas people you know they're, they're, they're Babylon was never conquered by the Romans and it didn't turn Christian it was under pagan I mean for a while it was under Zoroastrian rule I mean if you're familiar with Zoroastrians they were an ancient you know an ancient religion so for a while they would they were under there eventually the Muslims would you know would, would come over but we won't talk about that you know this evening you know, we'll, we'll stick to the, to, to the year 70 but right there and then a whole new Judaism is flourishing whole new now this tells us one of the most important lessons that we have from this era and why we call this you know a turning point a defining moment is that that gave us an understanding that regardless of where we are no matter where we're going to be because this was the greatest single challenge to Jewish uh, destiny that we've ever had wherever we're gonna go we are gonna be able to exist because why because we're gonna now change our thinking just a little bit the torah becomes the focal point the torah and it's and the mitzvahs and the understanding there's no more three groups anymore now it's all pharisee it's they don't even call themselves pharisees anymore it's all just jews now it's all one big happy family or come maybe two or three happy families but you know what cousins and everybody is learning now to survive in a milieu that we haven't had before without the temple and that becomes a lesson for Jews throughout history because you know what we're gonna we're gonna see through the next four weeks we're gonna see how even though history doesn't repeat itself but you know what does man repeats himself so as much as history doesn't man keeps repeating the story over and over and over again and we're gonna see next week when we start talking about Muhammad and the birth of Islam, what that does is that also going to change the face of Judaism, but in a different way, and we'll pick it up next week's part two. All right? No? No? More? Oh. Less. Where is. Please, please, please. So there is actually no written records of what happened to them? Well, you know what, I'll tell you what, tell you what, Jews never really wrote history. There was never a Jew besides Josephus that actually sat down and wrote a history book or a text of what happened in that particular time. All we know is, as I said, mentioned before, that history is written by the victors. If there was a victor in this, in, in this age, it was certainly the Pharisees. The Pharisees became, were, were victorious because what came out, who was the leadership of the Jewish people now? 
The Pharisees. So the Pharisees wrote, if you take a look at the Talmud, you'll always note that mm-hmm. since they were right, they, they were the authors of the Talmud, and the Talmud sort of became our unofficial history book as well as the book of rules and regulations, that the Pharisees, that the Sadducees ceased to exist. There's no more remnants of them, there's no more talk about them, there's, there's no quarrels, there's no more debates. They just, they just left the face of the earth. Now whether they had a community that existed for another 50 years or 100 years even, no one, no one paid any attention to them but at the all. Essenes the Essenes actually were separated. The Essenes were completely separated. The Essenes were living in a... They, 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 they probably... It was very hard not to assimilate. I mean, to, to be able to, to function as a body of people with a community, you need to have an infrastructure. You need to be able to have enough members to keep going. You know, this is a period where the Romans were vicious. I mean, you know, when they turned against Judea, they really turned against Judea. I mean, you know, you, 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 you see what happens. I mean, Pontius Pilate, you know, it was, 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 Jesus was not the only guy that was crucified. I mean, they were crucifying people constantly over and over and over again. It was a, it was a very, very upheaval period. And, uh, and you know, if you're, not, if you're not prepared and geared up, to survival, you're gone. You 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 just can't exist anymore. I mean, your trade routes are cut off. Your you know, there's no business anymore for you. I mean, don't forget that the Pharisees had, and I don't want to get into this too much because next week we'll really talk about this. Had a chain. I mean, you know, there were people already living in Babylon before this. I mean, there were Jews. There was Jewish communities in Babylon since the time of the first destruction. 500 years before this, there was always communities living in Babylon. So when the Jews did come to Babylon, it wasn't like they had to start fresh. There was really an infrastructure of Jews there, which they incorporated. Oh, they invited the people in, Sura, Pompetissa. You know, there were big cities there already that, you know, Jews had come in. There were businesses. So, you know, the refugees, you know, they, they were able to they were able to make it. Living as a, isolated in a small little place called Qumran, there's no, there's no business to be done. There's, 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 there's nothing any, there's no more. Because you had to sell your pottery to who are you gonna sell your pottery to? Who you you know you 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 made you made horseshoes for whom? No horses anymore. So eventually, eventually it's Anatevka, right? You know, everybody leaves and you know, and, and, and the Pharisees were able, you know, had the foresight to move to Pompadisa and to Sura and to, to other places within Babylon and start again. They say we'll have to start from scratch. And when we're starting from scratch means that, you know what, you start building shoals and communities, you start a leadership, you start, you know, you, 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 make, you make a board of directors, you know, and things start flourishing, you start trading, you start doing business, back and forth, and next thing you know, hey, and if the government is, uh, and if the government is with you, I mean, if the government is not uh, oppressing you, then, then you're in good shape. Don't forget there were Jews all over, you know, there were Jews in Asia Minor, there were Jews, there were Jews in Rome, there, was, there were Jews already in Rome at this time. The Jews had moved to Rome, you know, right after the destruction of the temple. They had taken thousands of Jews to Rome. I mean, you know, the Roman Jews today can say that they're, they're probably one of the oldest communities in the world. You know, certainly older than Eastern Europe or, you know, Western Europe and, you know, all these other places. Jews were in Yemen. You know, we know, we know Jews were in Yemen since the time of the destruction of the temple. So Jews moved all over the part of that fertile crescent, you know, Asia Minor, and they were able to, you know, because of because they were had a commonality, a common language, and, you know, this, they were able to form, you know, alliances with each other, and then Jews began to understand, hey, ho, 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 you know what? If we're going to exist, we better start to rethink our positions. You know, so the Messiah, okay, is very important, and it became part and parcel. But more important than dogma, than who cares what we believe in, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta exist, because what happens to the vast majority of of, of, of Roman Empire? It all becomes Christian, right? They all, they, you, you, we don't have any more those small little uh, groups running around. They all, they all become Christians in one, you know, one huge religion. It takes time. I mean, not everybody, you know, overnight, but over a period of, a, you know, I would say over 500, 500 to 700 years, most of the Roman Empire turned, becomes Christian, you know. And the, the Jews figured out the only ones that are stubborn. They're just stubborn. Why won't you just convert and leave us alone? No. Because we know the truth. We have the truth, and we're going to go down to the ground with the truth. And that's, that's going to be the story of the history for the next few weeks. You're going to see over and over again the same thing. 
And the next week we'll pick it up from this moment that the Jews are living in Babylon and are, and are building these, these, these huge yeshivas and edifices and, and things. All of a sudden, things are going to change a little bit because the birth of, I'm, I'm not going to tell you, the birth, you'll have to come back next week and figure out who we're talking about. Well, you yes. One week that I, I lost me. Okay. You said that there were all kinds of messiahs and so forth and Jesus had Paul. Yeah. He was like his, what, PR guy? Well, with, no, Paul actually never met Jesus. Oh. Paul, never met, Paul never saw Jesus. Then why Paul, was Jesus? Oh, okay. There were lots of people, there were lots of people running around. They said there were many messiahs. Jesus had a band of followers. These band of followers established a church. They established a church with, let's say, there were a thousand members. Let's say there were a thousand members. One of these members may have been, or he, he claims he wasn't, he wasn't, was Paul. Paul had heard of Christianity. So Jesus had a following already. It wasn't like, you know, he, it came out of the sky. Now what Paul writes is on his way to Damascus, he has what he calls his epiphany. He has a vision of Jesus coming to him. Now, if he had a vision of, let's say, Abba Perlmutter coming to him, he would have, you would have, instead of the cross, a guy in a gray suit, you know, like this would be the symbol of Christianity, guy walking around. And I bet you that Jesus looked more like I do than he does like the American Jesus, like, you know, a star, a star quarterback for the University of Texas, you know, walking out there six foot two, you know, eyes of blue, you know, and all of that stuff. No, 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 that, that you know, she probably looked you know, like that. But that's why Jesus stayed where everybody else kind of, you know, whoever brought a message, whatever, just, you know, it came and went, it came and went, it came and went, but he actually had a little established church where Paul then took that little established church and basically made it worldwide, made it worldwide, and he was a, a, a just an unbelievable ma amount of energy, the amount that he traveled and, and, the, and the amount of letters that he wrote and everything that he did. He certainly changed the face of Christianity. You know, there's, you know, there's nothing to talk about. And by that had a tremendous effect upon Jews. I mean, a tremendous effect upon Jews. And uh, you see, because at the birth of Christianity, you know, anti-Semitism started to flourish and, you know, all of that stuff. So that, that's what I meant when I say that, that Paul, you know, didn't make him. I couldn't say Paul made him, but he certainly brought his word out to the, to the world. He was a great marketer, tremendous marketer, you know. Got an MBA from Harvard. Oh, yeah. I'm telling you, he had an MBA from Harvard and then and, 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 and some, you know, and some, uh, you know. But the miracle here, I mean, there's a, there's a couple of miracles, really, that take place. I mean, of course, you know, Christianity, you know, benefited from being at the right place at the right time. There's no question that, you know, pagans were ready for a change. And, you know, and the message of a Messiah, someone coming to, you know, to, to heal you and to give you was a, was, a, was a salve, you know, upon these people who, you know, who were poor and all of that, you know, all of that. So it certainly was there at the right time. But we should not underestimate the miracle of the Jews at this time. We should never underestimate the, the, the strength of character that people have because, we, it, you know, I, we only minimize it, you know, it will take weeks and weeks and weeks to talk about, you know, all the details of the war and the aftermaths of these two wars. I mean, Jews had fought two wars in 70 and 130. I mean, they're only 60 years apart. It's nothing. I mean, it's like fighting World War II and fighting another one right now. A huge, you know, two huge wars against the strongest empire in the world, you know, bar none. Lost both wars, lost them. Decisively, I mean, we're not talking about where you know, like, okay, you know, both sides, you know, move and we call it, you know, a peace. I mean, we lost both wars decisively. Lost a tremendous amount of people. Lost, a, a, lost their land. You know, gave up uh, the land, and yet were able to survive. I mean, you can never ever underestimate the strength of a Jewish kishka. You know, that's what we always talk about, the strength of a Jewish, I mean, it doesn't sound that good in English, intestine. I mean, you know, the strength of a Jewish intestine. No, I mean, just, but, you know, the Jewish kishka, you know, the, the, the strength of a Jewish kishka can never be underestimated here. I mean, it's an equally great miracle that, we're, that, that Jews were alive then, and then as we'll see throughout, you know, throughout the ages that you know, we're still around. It's incredible. I mean, it's just incredible that they didn't give up and say to themselves, you know what, come on. The rest of the world is going Christian. What the heck? And I'm sure there, there were Jews. I'm sure you know that did do that. But uh, thank, thank. We're 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 grateful. We're but, grateful that they, they that they stuck to it. But don't you think it also helps that because they were demonized, that if, if everyone's hating two of us, then we become stronger. Oh yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. That that doesn't kill you makes you stronger. 
I mean, no, for sure. I mean, I, I agree. I, you know, I, I believe in that, you know, wholeheartedly. You know, it, it made them stronger, but it also showed that, you know what? Just, just to sum it up, I mean, this is the old story. I, I must have told this a million, a billion times already. I mean, it's as old as, you know, the last time I told this, my, my children say the Dead Sea was still sick. The last time they heard this one, you know. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a story of the, of, of the ice cap melting. You know, the ice cap is melting. You know, oh, our vice president just won the, 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 the Nobel Prize for telling us that it's hot in, um, in California. Okay, fine, okay. But you know what? So the ice cap is melting, and scientists say that the world is going to be flooded. So everybody, all the religions run to different places, like the Anglicans to Canterbury, the Muslims to, to, to Mecca, the Christians to the Vatican, the Jews to Jerusalem, you know, and everybody's giving their message. And you know, to the whole the world is basically the message of all religious leaders are the same and say that you know what we got we have about a couple of weeks, three weeks or a month, you know, to repent because we're gonna soon meet our maker. And the rabbi in Jerusalem says, Hey brothers and sisters, we got a month to learn how to live underwater. <laughs> right? I mean that's that's and that's and that's been the message of Jews, you know, throughout history that you know we've been able to, to you know to take the situations, you know, and as and, and as bleak as they may seem because they, they couldn't see much bleaker after the war of Bar Kokhba when, you know, when Hadrian really came in with force and, you know, outlawed Judaism, wanted to destroy Judaism, made it a penalty of death to study Torah, to keep Shabbos, to circumcise your children. You know, all of these things were under the penalty of death. I mean, that was, that was, that's, that's harsh. I mean, that is very harsh and to be able to survive that kind of a, of a hit, to survive that kind of a hit and to be able to regroup and to not, like, what Judy said, not only to survive it, but to actually grow stronger from it, is a testament to what Mark Twain said. I mean, when I, when I went, um, and he wasn't facetious when he said, hey, you know what the Romans, where are the Romans today? Gone. You know, where are the Babylonians today? Gone. But who sticks around? We, the Jews, the Jews are around against all odds. We're, we'll, we're, we're still here. This is only the first chapter of our story. We got another three chapters to go. It only gets... It only gets more interesting as we go by, because next week we'll pick it up round two.